First Republic Bank has been taken over by federal regulators and will be sold to J.P. Morgan, making it the third major bank to go under in less than two months within 200, with $229 billion in total assets. At the time of closure, First Republic Bank has become the second largest bank failure in American history, 90 days apart, by the way, losing about 40% of its deposit in the first quarter of the year amid rising interest rates and after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank earlier this year, causing a growing cohort of depositors to move their money to banks seen as safer and offering more attractive returns. As of mid-March, about 70% of First Republic deposits were uninsured. That's that's a big number, meaning they were larger than $250,000 guaranteed limit. The FDIC estimates the cost of First Republic receivership will be about $13 billion, less than the $20 billion that is estimated at the cost of Silicon Valley Bank. First Republic's 84 branches in eight states will reopen Monday as branches of J.P. Morgan Chase. Tom. Well, you know, some of you may walk down the street in quaint little towns and you'll notice a garage sale and you go up, maybe buy a trinket, get lucky, find an old baseball card there. Uh, Jamie Diamond on the weekend walks down the street and buys banks. And this is Chase. <laughs> this is Ch- hey, there's First Republic. <laughs> Do you take a check? Um, the And what is happening here is the consolidation of 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 the banking industry, because ever since 2008, the last crisis, things have become more and more lax. You know, you've had a variety of things that have uh, Glass-Steagall and other things that were designed to help it. But now you have banks failing, except the FDIC, think of that as the deductible. Like when your car crashes, you $500 deductible at the body shop, and then the other guy that crashed into you, hopefully their insurance pays the rest. Well, the FDIC, the little sticker on the window that says $250,000 deposit, think of that as the deductible. But now Jan and Yellen, when SVB crashed, they created that new vehicle that the banks can get their hands on, which protects $250,000 and up. So it basically goes like this. It, it promotes irresponsibility mm-hmm. because now the banks can be very re- irresponsible because FDIC will get part. Janet Yellen and Treasury will get the other part, and then the bank will get bought because there's loans in there. There's car loans, home loans with good people and things, and J.P. Morgan says, I'll take those loans over here, I'll collect the interest on them, and I'll help you out. And so what is happening is a consolidation of banking, and then unstable banks are are failing. Um, this is also is very interesting, is SVB and um, First Republic, J.P. Morgan, specifically Jamie Dimon, is trying to walk back into Silicon Valley to have a foothold there. Remember, it was 2016 that he was the first of the big banks, and he came out in an annual banking letter, and he said, listen, Silicon Valley is coming. They're smart. They're clever. They're going to take away consumer pain points, and they're not going away, and they don't take prisoners. So he was warning the traditional banking industry of basically the looming fintech. And he's trying to come back in and make himself... um, you know, relevant, make J.P. Morgan relevant. Three years later, he says, oh, you know, um, I just want to let you know, Chase is not a tourist. We're not just visiting. This is not a lecture tour that we're doing here in Silicon Valley. We're here and we want to do things. And so you're, you're basically seeing Chase saying it wants to be the biggest, and they're, they're not— I even, respect that. I respect I do that. Too. Listen, Sandy Wall uh, had a chance when the whole story went— you know, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon used to work for Sandy Wow. Sandy told Jamie, do whatever you want to do, run the company. The first thing is, uh, Jamie Dimon does is fires his daughter. Nah. <laughs> it's a Pretty very wild thing. story. And then the wife says, what are you doing? You let this guy that. fire your daughter. He <laughs> says, you can't fire my daughter. He says, you told me to run the company. He used to be a city guy. So everybody knows in that world, if you're going to talk about the Michael, the Kobe of this era, Jamie's the guy. And he's not slowing down. And he's going to be a guy that when you're thinking about someone's going to be a you know company to buy, everybody points at Jamie. So he's done a great job. You got to give him credit. But the question now becomes, quietly, as much as they want to downplay this, how many people are now sitting there saying, "Listen, man, I'm not waiting anymore. We're part of a regional. We're part of a community. We're leaving. Just go to one of the big five. This is two in ninety days or 120 days. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about like twenty billion dollar bank or forty. These are two two hundred billion dollar banks we're talking about. Two hundred. You know how big two hundred billion is? If you were to look at some of the companies that we all know about, Starbucks size. If you go to you know Coca Cola, if some of these come, how big are these companies? These are two hundred billion dollar companies. Mm-hmm. There, there's not that many two hundred billion dollar companies that we're talking about. Tom, 
Who's next based on this? Who are they talking about? I've heard a couple different names. I'm curious to know who you're hearing about being possible. I wish next. I had the whole list in front of me, but it's basically there's a variety of lists out there, and there's some ones that are right at the top that are stretched on on the loans they made and the things that they invested in. They invested some bonds, which are now have moved on the interest rate, meaning picture it this way. Banks bought I'll put it this way for gold, for the average person to understand. They bought gold high, now gold's low, and they're have, having trouble selling the gold, and that's supposed to offset the loans they have. So it's like, whoops, you now can't sell the gold to pay off all, all your loans or to cover all your loans. What's very, very, there's another very, very interesting thing that's going on in the middle of this is what you just said, Pat. Goldman came out, and they had a crappy earnings quarter, but... They had a whole bunch more deposits. Now, where did that come from? Of course. Schwab came out and had actually a solid quarter, but they got a bunch more deposits. And Schwab was saying, you know, we were very surprised. Schwab has a money fund that's right around 4%, and that's fairly low risk. Like the lowest risk you can get is like a standard money fund. 4% may not seem like a lot until until you think back that Ma and Pa have been looking at interest rates of half a percent, 1%, or nothing. And all of a sudden— Money's being moved to money markets right now. Money's being made to— Moving markets say, hey, mom, ma, pa, talk about it. They say, well, at least we can get 4% and we're not exposed to this zaniness going on in the yeah. stock market. So, so if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.